Hello, I'm Larissa Warhol. I'm the founder of Green Earth Climate Action, which is a uh, international NGO providing ecosystem services to smallholder farmers and sustainable supply chains. Um, I've been living in Kenya since 2015, where I also have a local Kenyan agribusiness that processes a local non-timber forest product into uh, biofuel and organic uh, farm inputs. Um, I was part of the inaugural cohort for the uh, certificate in tropical forest landscapes. And so the, some of the work I'm going to be sharing with you today was connected to my LT project, but then it also has also evolved into its own organization. Uh, so as I mentioned, I have, um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I've been working in Kenya since 2015. And I first started working with um, a local indigenous nut called the Croton Nut. And my local business here is called EcoFix Kenya. And we uh, source this nut from 6,000 smallholder farmers. And then, as I mentioned, we process it into biofuel and organic um, agricultural inputs. As part of my work with the farmers, we were um, my team was responsible for doing trainings with them around sustainable sourcing of the nut. And then we also started various tree planting programs. Um, and you know, through my my work with LT and, and some of the work we were doing on the ground, we realized that we could actually be expanding this work both within the Croton supply chain, but also other sustainable supply chains to be providing other additional ecosystem services uh, for smallholder farmers, um, specifically mainly in agricultural supply chains in Kenya and East Africa. Uh, so one of the things that we were really looking at, um, and this was you know, part of conversations we were having around carbon market, uh, the tree planting was, can we be actually accessing the carbon markets um, for the smallholder farmers? Um, and, and a lot of the work they were doing both with the tree planting, but both with using our organic agricultural inputs, um, you know, we're really, we, we were realizing we're reducing CO2 emissions, and then they were also having a lot of improvements on their farms. Um, and they could in fact be receiving then additional income if we were able to access the carbon markets. When we were looking at this uh, specifically just for the Croton farmers, we realized that um, you know, we were pretty kind of, kind of a small project. I think over a three year period, we only planted about 150,000 trees and a lot of them didn't have you know, a great survival rate. We weren't necessarily checking and maintaining on the trees. So um, out of the LT project and then, you know, from other people I was talking to, we created a new organization. And so it's a US 501c3 in the United States um, called Green Earth Climate Action. And then we have a corresponding local organization called Arthena Jema Agroforestry. And this is a registered CBO in Kenya. Uh, and so the organization itself was created where we could create a model where we were engaging farmers in Clement Smart Agroforestry agroforestry practices um, that both improve their farms, but then also earn them additional income. And so we were initially, again, accessing the smaller farmers through the Croton markets, but we have been working in other supply chains in Kenya um, with coffee farmers, with tea farmers. Um, we haven't really started talking to the rice farmers yet, but we're looking at different you know, commercial agricultural supply chains where we're helping the farmer, but then we're also looking at how you're then improving the whole ecosystem and creating more sustainable supply chains, even as some of these crops might be being exported internationally. Um, and so again, the work from uh, EFK expanded. And so we're not just doing uh, tree planting, we're also doing trainings on organic farming, water management, pest regulation, uh, how to use non-timber forest products beyond just croton, like what else is out there. And then one of the interesting things that we work with the farmers a lot about is talking to them about um, you know, the importance of biodiversity and maintaining trees. A lot of the farmers themselves are engaged in commercial timber supply chains. Um, and so they often wanna plant um, non-indigenous trees, but currently our model is promoting planting indigenous trees. And we've done a lot of research looking at, you know, what indigenous trees are good agroforestry trees. Um, and, and, and that actually has been an interesting thing in and of itself because we work in some, some different climatic regions. And so some of these trees vary depending on, on where we're working. 
And so, you know, our current activities to date, uh, we, we were trying to get started in April of 2020, um, but that was right when COVID hit. Uh, we are planting with the rains. So in Kenya, there are two rainy seasons, uh, one from, you know, about March to June, and then there's another one from about October to December. Uh, so we were not able to get out into the field in April of 2020 because uh, the country was locked down. Um, but we did get out in October, so that was exciting. Um, and so we were, we're currently right now playing around with different models. Um, we're dealing with a group of farmers, you know, who some of whom vary from primarily doing subsistence crops where they might have, you know, a small percentage of their farm is dedicated to commercial crops to other farmers who have their much larger farms with a lot of commercial crops. Um, we're de dealing with a lot of varying education levels. And so we're looking at, you know, what kind of training models do we actually need? Or are we trying to do different things in different places? And, and what does that mean for us um, just from a logistics perspective? Um, and so right now we've gone through two planting seasons. And so we got out in October and November of 2020. Um, we held a bunch of stakeholder meetings and we ended up distributing 20,000 indigenous seedlings uh, with about 100 farmers. Um, and at this point, these trees have been monitored at six months and all the trees have been tagged. And then, you know, this past, starting this past February, we went out and we were holding stakeholder meetings. We had a series of extensive agroforestry trainings that took place over the course of two to three meetings. And we ended up planting um, about 50,000 seedlings with 500 farmers. And we're working in five different counties, two of which are semi-arid. Uh, so if you notice, the second time we went out, um, we planted more trees with more farmers, but the average you know, number of trees per farm was a little bit lower uh, than our first planting season. And again, this was partially due because we were expanding regionally and we were working with farmers who had smaller farms um, and who, and, and those farmers too, we realized needed um, you know, a different level of, of training. And so I've talked about a little bit about this, but you know, some of the farmers do have low education levels. Um, so we had to you know, adapt what we were doing with the trainings. Um, in terms of when we were doing on-farm visits, so we have, so as I mentioned, the trees get monitored and tagged six months, but after the trees are planted, we actually go out and visit the farms uh, initially just to make sure the trees are planted correctly. Um, and so they're planting the trees, but they're not necessarily embracing what we're calling our regenerative agricultural practices. And, and this would be, you know, a high level of intercropping, um, really thinking through um, embracing the full range of trainings that we're providing. So people are planting their trees or planting their trees well, but they're kind of defaulting to just sort of planting on the borders of their farms. Um, and we're hoping to really, as we work with them um, in future seasons, to get them to really be planting the trees in, in, in their actual farms. Um, we noticed that we had to really modify the trainings depending on the region and the supply chain. Um, and for the most part, the farmers were planting the seedlings correctly, but every now and then we found some farmers where the seedlings come in little black uh, polyurethane bags and sometimes they were actually planting the bags with the seedlings. So that often required um, some that they had to replant and, and we really had to focus on that on training. Um, and then in terms of tree monitoring, I mean, this is still an ongoing conversation we're having. Right now we're physically tagging the trees. Um, and then we've been using a couple different technology platforms to see if it makes more sense to be taking pictures of the trees. <laughs> but currently right now the programs we're using, um, you have to take individual pictures of the trees. Uh, and um, at this point we already have 70,000 trees. And if we're trying to plant, you know, close to a million, um, that just seems, um, we're trying to figure out just like the logistics of having a million pictures of seedlings that look fairly similar. So, uh, but some of the things that have really gone well is that the, we planted in 2020 are growing really well and they're really big already. Um, you know, this is a seedling that was planted. It was, you know, a little baby, six month old seedling, um, and it's already quite big. Um, we were, you know, in terms of the carbon markets, we were thinking of, you know, trying to submit, to get evaluated and submit for uh, carbon offsets in year three, um, but we're hoping we're, we're seeing how the trees are growing and tracking that to see if we can do that sooner. Um, and what we're also noticing too, is that, you know, there's not necessarily a hundred percent survival rate. We're probably seeing right now about 
a 90 to 95% survival rate. But where the seedlings, where the small seedlings that have not survived, the farmers are actually voluntarily replacing them. So that's, that's good to know that they're trying to actually maintain the number of seedlings that they have enrolled in our programs. Um, in general, we've had uh, more interest than we can uh, support. So the farmers are very interested in the project. Um, and right now we're turning away farmers. We don't have enough resources, uh, both um, just from people, uh, just, you know, people working for the organization as well as money. Uh, we have been able to create a network of local stakeholders, um, and that was very essential for accessing communities and sourcing seedlings. And so we're working with local nurseries, and so we're making sure that the seedlings that we're distributing are seedlings that are, re you know, work well for the region that are not being brought in from a different region. And so we know that they'll grow well um, on the farms that we're putting them on. Um, and so we have, you know, we've developed networks with both local nurseries, uh, as well as people working in, you know, some of the different local supply chains. Um, and as I, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, we're accessing a lot of the farmers initially through EFK, but we've expanded outside the Croton network now and are working with you know, coffee and tea farmers as well. Uh, so in general, I'd say right now, you know, it's, we're still, it's still an ongoing process. We're still expanding. We're still learning a lot of things. Um, but for us, I think at this point, um, you know, partnerships and local stakeholder buy-in were essential just to get where we've gotten. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend trying to launch a new organization in the middle of a pandemic, uh, but we, we've managed to at least pull it off and um, hit the ground running uh, and get a bunch of seedlings planted. Um, as I mentioned, we, we you know we're, we've really developed strong partnerships with local nurseries. The other thing too um, that has been really helpful is some of the county governments are very interested in our work. Um, and so we've been partnering with them as well. Uh, and they've provided resources and access also to nurseries. Um, we've really needed to be flexible and maximize limited resources for a pretty small team. Um, and then we, and, and because we also work seasonally, um, you know, we bring on people seasonally, but they're not necessarily full-time time workers. Um, and at this point now, you know, as we're, the, right now we're, we've had low rain in Kenya for 2021. So we were planning on plant, doing a planting season in October and November, but we're going to, you know, kind of see how the rains are and maybe we delay it until next year. Um, but, but if that happens, and I think it gives us the opportunity to really take a look at our programs and our trainings and see how, you know, we can be modifying them. Um, right now we are out doing a lot of farm visits. And so talking to the farmers to see what would be most beneficial for them. Um, and really just making sure that the work we're doing, um, you know, is really about helping the communities uh, while also improving, you know, local biodiversity and helping to create sustainable supply chains. Uh, so I look forward to hearing uh, any questions you might have. And I'm, I've been very happy to share my work with you. Thank you.